Greetings, good people. Welcome. We are so honored to be sharing virtual space in real time with you. Welcome to the next gathering of our year-long Disparity to Parity webinar series, where we learn from the important historical precedents of supply management, price floors, cooperatives, and farm justice to open space and collectively think through how to update these agricultural parity policies for racial and gender justice, and for agroecology and climate survival. I am Garrett Grady Lovelace, faculty at American University School of International Service and associate director of the Center for Environment, Community and Equity here in Piscataway Lands, also known as DC, and co-founder of the Disparity to Parity website and project. This event will last for about 90 minutes. We're here together with 15 minutes near the end for Q&A. So if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and type it in in the chat box, which we open for the whole time, as well as in the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. Closed captioning is available to those who need it. So please just click on the option at the bottom for your screens and you'll, we'll be recording the whole thing. And the recording will be available on the SIS YouTube channel and embedded within the Disparity to Parity website itself. So economic justice for farmers, urban growers, and fishers is inextricably linked to justice for farm workers and food workers at large. After all, farm workers, as Rudy Arredondo of Rural Coalition says, and others, farm, farm workers are just farmers without land. So we are deeply honored to be joined by Dolores Huerta, a living legend in farm worker organizing and agrarian justice advocacy and leadership, as well as by Heal Food Alliance alongside other esteemed panelists. Ms. Dolores Huerta most recently has joined the international solidarity with the Indian farmer uprisings, in which tens of millions of farmers are risking their lives to protect the minimum support price and secure farm markets as in parity in a vast nonviolent struggle against agro-corporate capture. The Disparity to Parity project stands in strong solidarity and collaboration with this Indian farmer revolution. Today's webinar is part one on economic justice, and we're focusing on federal and local ag policies in the US Turtle Island context. In one month, join us for part two, economic justice in the international agricultural policy context. This webinar will be led by our collaborators, Institute for Ag and Trade Policy, and will be a counter to the WTO ministerial meetings happening at that time. We are building upon the inspiring momentum of the UN Food System Summit counter mobilization. That webinar will also deliberately correspond to the one year anniversary of the Indian farmer uprisings and the general strike in Delhi a year ago. This disparity to parity project is dynamic and expanding. It builds upon action research collaborations and alliances with farmers, farm workers, farmer organizations, engaged scholars and students across and beyond disciplines with journalists, activists and policymakers. Please join us. The project is rooted in knowledge from farm justice elders from Ralph Page, Jerry Pennick, and Ben Burkett of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund, our key collaborators, onto Kathy Ozer, Brad Wilson, George Naylor, and Patty Edwardson Naylor of the National Family Farm Coalition Networks, among others. Another key farm justice elder has been Jim Goodman himself. He is National Family Farm Coalition president. And he and his wife, Rebecca, ran a 45 cow organic dairy and direct market beef farm in southwest Wisconsin for 40 years. His farming, his farming roots trace back to his great grandparents' immigration from Ireland during the famine and the farm's original purchase in 1848. A farm activist, Jim credits more than 150 years of failed farm and social policy as his motivation to advocate for a farmer-controlled, consumer-oriented food system. He serves as a board member of the Midwest Environmental Advocates and Family Farm Defenders and has degrees in animal science from University of Wisconsin Platteville and reproductive physiology from South Dakota State University. And he quit farming in a blaze of glory with this amazing op-ed um, calling out the injustices of policy in the Washington Post. Jim is also Disparity to Parity co-editor and a generous, humble mentor, sharing his valuable experience in international food sovereignty advocacy, his critical analysis of food system racism, and his abiding wisdom and optimism that moving from disparity to parity and solidarity is not only possible, it's probable. Please welcome our moderator and this extraordinary panel that I'm so honored to be um, sharing space with. Thank you. Well, thank you, Garrett, for that very generous introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, 
Thank you to Kate and all the folks at American University for making this webinar possible. Um, I guess the idea of parity and production management were clearly aims of the New Deal farm programs uh, from 1941 basically to 1952. Um, they started to fall out of favor. And of course, during the 70s under Earl Butts were much more quickly taken apart. Uh, nowadays, farming fence row to fence row, maximum production, global export markets are touted as being progressive farming. But uh, that's kind of a vastly different view of progressive than, than we saw from the original New Deal programs. Um, as a farmer for many years, I, I have an idea of how farm programs should work. And I also have a knowledge of how they failed. Um, those progressive ideas from the New Deal at their heart were about economic justice, not just fair prices for farmers, but economic justice for everyone. As Jesse Jackson noted a number of years ago, the best urban policy starts with the best farm policy. And good rural policy can protect the environment, keep small farmers on the land, support prosperous rural and urban communities with a new business infrastructure, allow more beginning farmers access to land, and provide healthier local food for everyone. And I guess those ideas have, have always been at the heart of, of what NFFC and our allies stand for. Policy change around fair farm prices, farm worker rights, anti-racism, we're against misguided trade policies. We're certainly in favor of trying to change the system of farming to, to better fit in with the, with the realities of climate change as well as ways to mitigate those, those changes. Um, <clears throat> and antitrust, of course, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue all the time. Uh, and certainly we, we see a need for a just transition back to a more rational rural policy. Now, some of these ideas are getting some, and I said some, attention in Congress and the Biden administration. And through this project, we hope to continue to highlight these issues um, and I think today's panelists will give us a view of what economic justice can and should look like. So today our first speaker is Patty Lavera. Uh, Patty is a food consultant who serves as a policy advisor for the campaign uh, for the campaign on family farms and the environment, which is a coalition of state and national groups working to fight factory farms. Previously, Patty helped start and grow Food and Water Watch, serving as their food and water program director for 14 years. Patty has a bachelor's degree in environmental sciences from Lehigh University and a master's degree in environmental policy from the University of Michigan. Before joining Food and Water Watch, Patty was a deputy director of, of the Energy and Environment Program at Public Citizen and a researcher at the Center for Health and Environmental Environment and Justice. And I'm very happy to say a, a good friend of mine for many years. So Patty, take it away. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming. And you get to put up with me first. So I'm going to share some goofy looking slides just so you have something to look at while I talk about <laughs> some of these big picture concepts of the many ways we can identify and then hopefully fix um, injustice uh, in really every we have it in every sector uh, of our food and ag system. I'm going to focus on a couple that um, Campaign for Family Farms and the Environment focuses on. Um, so let me put that up there. Okay. So Campaign for Family Farms and the Environment is a coalition of six groups. So it's Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, Land Stewardship Project, Dakota Resource Action, uh, Dakota, sorry, Dakota Rural Action, um, Missouri Rural Crisis Center, Institute for Ag and Trade Policy, and Food and Water Watch. And all those groups do great work, you know, at the national level, at the state level. But the thing that brings us together when we're acting as CFFE is really a critique of the system that has given us factory farms. So I think if you're spending your Tuesday afternoon on a webinar about disparity in the food system, you probably know what I'm talking about when I talk about factory farms, but just in case the quick definition is, this is a different system than we historically have had. Sorry, I'm throwing toys at my dog who's decided to join me in the last 10 seconds. Um, it's a different system than we historically have had to raise animals. And it, it is not just bigger livestock farms. It is a different system. So we're talking about potentially tens of thousands of animals in one place, confining them so that they are not 
integrated into a landscape in any way or integrated into any kind of diversified farm operation. And it's a different system when you bring that many animals together for the environment and you concentrate the waste. It's a different system for public health in terms of methods used to raise these animals. It's a different system for the animals themselves and those conditions. And it's a different system for the farmers who participate in that. And that's not the focus of today's webinar, but it is a topic worth looking at in a vertically integrated system where one company is, you know, in ownership of the thing of value through the whole chain, like, the, you know, a company owns the chicken from the beginning to the end, and the farmer is playing a role on contract of providing a service like keeping that chicken alive and growing. That is a different system than the system a lot of us are looking for when we think about a just agriculture system. So that's what brings our groups together. And it's happening all over the country. It's We see different aspects of it at different points. This is just kind of a snapshot of, of headlines in the last, just the last couple months. Um, and we know that it looks different if we think about the economics and we think about what is happening, whether it's fair or not. It's a different system. This is just one little snapshot that Food and Water Watch put together to look at Iowa as a case study. So if you look at Iowa from the early 80s, into the teens, and you could extend this out another five years, and as the trend continues, you see a really dramatic change in how animals, particularly hogs, are being raised in the state of Iowa. It's a place where they always raised hogs, but a bunch of things happened over those 25 years. One is that we saw a dramatic loss in the number of farms that were raising some hogs, right? Like an 80% or 85% loss in the number of farms but the number of hogs raised there increased exponentially. And so that means the farms that were raising hogs got much, 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 much bigger. That's that green line. So if you were in the hog business, on average, you were you know, 10 or 15 times bigger than you would have been 25 years earlier. But a bunch of other stuff happened during the same time, right? We saw the meat packers where these hogs get processed, merge, consolidate, get controlled by fewer and fewer players. We saw an erosion of what it meant to work in those plants in terms of wages for union protection. We saw the, the act of raising hogs become specialized and not part of, of a bigger diverse farm where you did one thing, it became a specialized piece and you might only raise those hogs for one stage of their life. Um, we And then we also, and we're gonna talk about, we saw a change and we can, we can bicker about which came first, but they're very much intertwined. We saw a change in the system that provides the feed for these hogs or for other animals in the food system, because we've seen the same trends there. So we have this, this problem of factory farms around the country. For CFFE, we talk a lot about, you know, why do we have them? We don't have them because they're efficient. We don't have them because they're just, or they treat anybody except really the, the meat packers who have designed this model fairly. It's not an efficient system. In fact, it's an extractive system because when you lose farm numbers and you just focus on animal numbers, that's a different rural economy. And it's an extractive rural economy because if we created wealth with just the sheer number of livestock, the streets of Iowa and the streets of Eastern North Carolina would be paved in gold because there's a tremendous number of hogs being raised there. But because of the way they're being raised and the economic model they're being raised in, the value from that type of production, this factory farm production leaves the community. And that wouldn't happen as much, and Ken can talk about this, he specializes in this, if we had a system where those animals were being raised, and it would probably be less animals total, if those animals were being raised on more but smaller farms whose money would stay in that community. It is a different model if we have a different, different system where we're raising those animals. So they're not efficient. In fact, they're extractive. And it's not inevitable that we have these facilities. So when we talk about... Um, you know, why we have them, we've changed a lot of laws, local, state, federal laws to allow these facilities to basically pollute with impunity. We have changed the structure of the industry that gets these animals to market. Uh, and we have fewer and fewer players doing that job because of consolidation. We've changed the policy about how we raise the crops that feed animals. We're gonna talk about that more in a minute. And all of this comes from a push in our policy to overproduce, to overproduce these grains so that they are cheap feed for these factory farms and to have factory farms that are essentially overproducing um, the animal products to lower the price that is received here. And also if we have extra, we then change our trade policy to find an outlet for that overproduction. So 
this is baked into our system. And you could argue that we have bad policy because the CAFOs want it, the, the factory farms want it, or you could argue that we have factory farms because of bad policy. And at some point it becomes a feedback loop where it doesn't matter what happened first, but they're both feeding off of each other. So if we have these and we don't have to, if they're not inevitable, what are the things we have to do to get rid of them? And dealing with economics and dealing with economic power in these markets is an important part of how we're gonna do that. So I'm gonna talk quickly about a couple of these and spend a little bit more time on one big one because of the, the focus of the disparity to parity project. So one thing we need to do is stop building new ones, right? So we can have a conversation about not citing new factory farms. The second thing we need to do is really talk about what is the marketplace where folks raise livestock and sell it and what can they get for it? And is that marketplace fair? Can you make money doing it a different way? And then the third piece we really need to talk about is what are we going to do about the feed? So the business model of factory farms depends on very cheap feed that is overproduced. So if we got rid of factory farms, we're going to have a lot of feed we have to figure out what to do with. And if we want to get rid of factory farms, we probably have to remove that prop of having this cheap feed. So we can talk quickly about some of these, but I want to spend more time on the feed piece. So there's lots of folks working around the country to say no more. We have enough of these. So there are state bills in places like Iowa. People have been working on it in Oregon. I think we'll start to see more. There is a federal bill to say you can't cite any more from Senator Booker. So that is a conversation people are having, and it is an opportunity to kind of change how we talk about this and change the narrative and say enough is enough. We don't need any more of them. And we can absolutely connect people if they want to hear more about those campaigns. We need to talk about a lot of things to make our markets more fair. And we are having a long overdue conversation about because of the pandemic and because of a bunch of things that kind of burst into view about how the livestock market is not working for almost everybody involved in it, except the big packers. There's a bunch of moving parts here that we need to do. We need to talk about how big these companies are by talking about mergers and what gets approved. We need to look back at previous mergers and maybe say some of them were wrong and we need to roll them back. We need to enforce laws like the Packers and Stockyards Act and USDA has, is in process doing some long overdue improvements there. We need to talk about you know, what happens in the marketplace. Can, can producers say where their product is from through mandatory country of origin labeling? What kind of transparency do we have? So there's a lot of options here. We're finally having a conversation about it. And that is an important part of dealing with a more just livestock production chain. So we can't forget all these pieces and there's a lot of activity finally going on there, which is great. And then because of the, the focus and there's really great materials on the Disparity to Parity website that people should check out, lots and lots of different viewpoints and history. So I'm not gonna go through every twist and turn over the years about our green production policy, but it is a policy. It is not an accident that we have huge amounts of feed available for factory farms. Uh, it's part of their business model and it's something that the meat companies that run that system rely on. So the key couple of points to talk about there, I think, and there's lots of folks um, you know, involved in, in the website and in this project who can elaborate more on the history. The key point is that we know it is a fact about agricultural production, especially when you're talking about crops you can store like corn or soy that we have a vicious cycle of overproduction and our policy, our farm policy can encourage that overproduction or it can try to, it can try to intervene and stop the vicious cycle of overproduction. We have that overproduction because individual farmers make a choice that's rational for them. And if the price is low and they're not gonna make very much per units, you know, per bushel of that crop, they might as well produce more units to try to, at the end of the day, get more money. And if they hold themselves back right, to try to stop the overproduction, there is no reward in that when everybody else is making their own individual decision. And we've seen this historically, and we've attempted in the past to have farm policy that intervenes in that back. vicious cycle. Okay, thanks. Um, and there's lots and lots of great materials on the website that talk about that history. You will hear about a couple key parts of it. One is parity, which is essentially a measurement of economic wealth, of health, right, is the buying power of a farmer being paid for his crop in line with other parts of the economy. We have a point in time that we measure against and say this is when the buying power of farmers was in balance. And that is a goal we can use to set lots of other pieces of our farm policy to say farmers should be able to get parity for what they produce. We used to have at different periods in our farm policy had periods where that was the goal. And that has basically been dismantled 
uh, over many decades and many farm bills to the point in the 90s where all the pieces of managing supply and trying to send signals not to produce so much, all of those pieces have basically been removed and we lost the last of them essentially in the 90s. So what we can do instead is talk about how do we modernize this concept. Um, we're not going to just say it's 1942 and we're going to do it exactly the same way. It was not a perfect system. And we can look at a bunch of things. We can look at parity price as the goal. We can look at the use of reserves to get extra production, that overproduction off the market so it's not crashing everybody's price. We can have a more nuanced, modern discussion about how do we control production through things like conservation and you know, maybe marketing allotments as opposed to acreage reduction, which was a controversy. And then we will have to talk about our trade policy so that everything we do domestically isn't just wiped away by imports. So it's a hard conversation. It's a complicated conversation. But if we want to address not having this really destructive, really unfair livestock system, we have to have this conversation about feed. So that's why it's really exciting to have um, you know, this, this disparity to parity conversation, to have all those viewpoints on the website that kind of pull in all the things we need to include so we can talk about stop building new factory farms, enforce antitrust rules and create competition for people raising animals the right way, shut down this pipeline of cheap feed, deal with the environmental impacts, deal with worker protections, and have this really kind of thoughtful wraparound farm policy that gets at a livestock sector that could actually be fair. So I will stop there. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Patty. Uh, our next panelist is Sienna Chrisman who has been an ab advocate for family farmers for nearly 15 years. She's a freelance writer and editor whose work has appeared in publications, including Civil Eats, Modern Farmer, Edible Brooklyn, and has worked as a research consultant for Farm Aid, Real Food Challenge, Illinois Stewardship Alliance, and, <clears throat> and other local and national farm organizations. In eight years at the New York-based nonprofit, Why Hunger? Sienna supported communities around the country working to build power and change their farm and food systems. Sienna holds a BA from Mount Holyoke College. Originally from Western Massachusetts, she now lives in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you, Sienna. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such a total pleasure to be here, um, Jim, with you and Patty, dear friends for a long time. Um, and Ken and Jose also, who I've known for many years. <clears throat> um, and of course, living legend, Dolores Huerta. Um, it's really a privilege. Um, thank you to American University and to the Disparity to Parity Project for hosting this webinar and having me here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. All right, uh, can you now, oh wait, from the beginning. There we go, okay. Um, so thank you, Patty. Um, that really set, set all of this, my conversation up um, really, really well um, and also a tough act to follow. I could listen to Patty talk about farm policy all day. Um, so I <laughs> will strive to be um, as somewhat as um, engaging as her. So, Dairy has really um, followed all of these same um, patterns as, as grain has um, in the last 50 years or so. Um, dairy also used to be run under um, a supply management program um, that was mostly dismantled in the 90s and the last vestiges, vestiges of dairy supply management were eliminated in the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, so we're, what I'm going to talk about really is like the particular problems, the particular issues around dairy. And then as Patty was saying, and it's, as this whole project, the Disparity to Parity project is looking at, um, look at a brand, brand new example of how a parity system could be done differently. Um, and this is like just the beginning of a conversation of that, um, that I'm really excited, NFFC is really excited to be having with folks. Um, how do I go forward, just there we go. Okay, so um, so I will be talking about dairy and I just wanna note some of the real particulars about dairy um, that make it complicated um, and different from grain, different from other livestock markets um, that are just good to note. 
<clears throat> so for one thing, the dairy industry has really always been complicated and volatile. All of farming is, but dairy, I would say perhaps the most. Um, as we've got here, high capital investment, um, cows, land, building, milking equipment, all makes entering dairy farming a really big upfront investment with generally, especially these days, really significant debt. Um, dairy farmers have very little negotiating power with processors who are the companies or cooperatives that bottle milk and make dairy products. Processors are the ones who buy the, the milk. Um, because milk is so perishable, um, much like seafood in that way, and there are many, many things about the dairy industry that actually are similar to, um, to the fishing industry, which is why um, the North American Marine Alliance has been such a strong partner um, and member of uh, National Family Farm Coalition for years. Um, so for, for farmers, since the milk produced by cows today won't keep and um, there's limited state of limited space in their bulk tanks and the cows don't stop producing tomorrow. There will be more milk coming tomorrow. Farmers often have no choice but to take whatever price the processor offers, especially in places that there is only one processor, um, which there are more and more places because of consolidation in the industry that there is only one processor. Um, so farmers are really what, we're, what are called price takers rather than price makers. Um, being a dairy farmer, as Jim can attest, uh, means it's it's a 24-7, 365 uh, job. Full, cows, uh, you can't take a day off. Cows need to be milked, um, come hell or high water, uh, twice a day or more, depending on the farm. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to touch on dairy pricing. Um, there is a saying in the dairy price world that only, I believe it's that only two people really understand dairy pricing, and one of them is dead. Um, I understand it somewhat. <laughs> I'm going to give you a really, really quick and dirty um, overview of it because a lot of folks talk about, you know, why why is dairy pricing so complicated? And a lot of us point to, you know, that's it's not unintentional. Um, dairy pricing is partly so complicated again because of these particulars of dairy, but also because the more complicated it is, the less power the producers have, right? Um, so I think the more dairy pricing can be um, understood, the better. So um, dairy farmers are paid for their milk according to a very complicated USDA uh, formula that's based on the end market prices of butter and cheese, um, having nothing to do at all with farmer cost of production, um, having to do with the component, the end market prices of the components in the milk. Um, the USDA price fluctuates from month, month to month, but it is frequently less than what it costs the producers to produce the milk. The processors, the buyers, can then adjust the farmer's final price based on premiums or, or deductions, but the farmer has no say in these decisions at all. And in fact, farmers will not learn what they were paid for their truckload of milk until their check arrives weeks later. Um, so just, just kind of imagine for a moment if, um, if that were your case, that you didn't really know what your paycheck was going to be until it arrived in your bank account. So that's the situation that farmers, dairy farmers are dealing with. At the same time, I've said that dairy is particular, but um, it's also, so for the last almost decade that I've really been immersed in dairy, these last couple of quotes are things that I've heard farmers say. Um, Dairy is, is really like the rest of farming, but more so. The themes of corporate concentration, of power imbalance, of rural decline, of environmental de degradation, all of these issues that this project is working on, that a lot of farmer advocates um, and a lot of others are working on, are really magnified in dairy. And so for NFFC, um, we have a strategic goal in in the coalition to address fair prices and economic uh, empowerment for farmers. And so we really decided that the dairy crisis um, was a very clear way to address those issues. Um, and we talk a lot about that, um, although again, there are these particulars of dairy that, that make it, that can kind of silo it, the broader issues, um, again, are, are magnified in dairy and, and it, it becomes kind of the canary in the mine of farming. As goes dairy, so goes the rest of the farm sector. And that makes it a valuable thing to focus on. So, um, so 
as the federal, um, so that's all kind of laying the context of dairy. Um, as federal policies, federal farm policies moved away from a program of managing the supply of dairy to much more of this get big or get out, um, focused on factory farms and all of the things Patty was discussing, the landscape of rural America has changed. And this is where we are now. So this is a very similar graphic to the one on hogs that Patty shared. Um, dairy herds have gotten much larger. Um, the majority of milk in the US is produced in factory farms or CAFOs, um, which is only really possible because of the cheap feed grain that Patty discussed. Um, so we have fewer farms that are larger, um, but we're also producing more milk. So historically, um, so that's all the same in, um, in dairy as well as everything else. Um, historically, federal dairy policy has had has um, tried to to cushion these um, the, the risks that I was discussing, the, the policy, the particular risks um, for farmers, for dairy farmers in the interest of a steady supply of milk um, and, a, and a stable farm economy. Um, but today's dairy farm dairy policy, as we know, um, favors large scale dairy operations instead. Um, and so here's how it works in practice. Sorry, I just okay lost my timer. Um, so this is an important piece to understand for, for the farmers, given the uncertainty of their prices and how low their prices generally are, uh, farmers will produce more milk. And exactly as Patty was saying, it doesn't make any sense for the individual farmer to produce less milk to try to change the market because that doesn't get him or her any benefit. So they are the the, there's a policy set up that makes farmers pr rationally produce more milk. Um, and they produce more milk in years of low prices to try to break even, um, which then sends the price down even further with the extra supply. And in high price years, when milk is, is higher priced, they produce more milk to try to catch up <clears throat> from those bad years. So either way, they're producing more milk now than we need. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, this is not how it used to be. We used to have a system that, um, that managed the supply. Um, and I'll get to that. <laughs> so the US, okay, thanks. The US then tries to export the excess, but other, farm, other countries don't necessarily want or need US milk, um, which can upset their own dairy economies. And you may remember the controversy around dairy in the negotiations of the new NAFTA, the USMCA, which was to try to get Canada to open up a tiny amount of its supply management system to US milk. The low prices that are paid to farmers are good for processors who get to buy below cost milk to turn into high value products. And then to partially compensate for those mil low milk pr pr prices, the USDA then offers the dairy farmers a taxpayer funded insurance program that pays out if, farm, if prices fall below a certain level, but that insurance price is still usually below the cost of production. So the government is subsidizing essentially the processors. So there's a much, there are better ways to do this, right? <clears throat> um, so NFFC has just spent the last couple of years um, developing our Milk from Family Dairies Act which was developed, um, as you can see, with um, input from our organization's proposals, um, partners and allies and others, um, and based on working systems um, that currently exist in dairy. Um, its goals are fair prices for farmers, uh, stable milk supply and prices for consumers, opportunities for new farmers, including those, including farm workers who have been historically excluded and a strong organic sector among others. So just to really quickly um, run over these, um, the, the pillars of the Milk for Family Dairies Act, um, and you folks are the first people who are seeing this. So our pillars are fair farmer prices based on their cost of production, balancing of supply and demand. <clears throat> and that is done through what we're calling a production base, which is the amount that each farmer may sell into the market, which is non-monetizable, which is really different than um, in Canada or the fishing industry, for example. Um, import and export controls. And so, so those are the kind of three main pillars. And then the other pieces that prop this up, um, that support that 
are rebuilding um, our regional dairy infrastructure. And I think Ken will talk a little to that and measures as Patty was saying to break up dairy market concentration. So you can read more. Um, the full plan is at um, is on the NFFC website. If Lisa, if you could drop that link into the chat. Um, and in the coming week or two, we will have much more material up about it, um, kind of way easier ways to, um, to kind of get into it. But the full policy proposal is there now. Um, and the last thing I want to say, um, there are all these benefits that I don't have time to go over. <laughs> and um, I finally want to conclude with that we have, so we've just introduced this um, specific policy proposal, the Milk from Family Dairies Act, and also as a way to really build support for that, um, we have a letter um, that, that um, a letter of support for, in general, fair dairy policy reform based on equitable parity principles. Um, you can sign on at this link here, and perhaps somebody can sign that that link, uh, can drop that link in the chat. Um, it's for organizations, um, and it's again, it's it is a uh, letter in support of these principles of what a fair dairy policy would look like. Um, the milk from family dairies policy, policy proposal has all of those principles, but we are not at NFFC necessarily even saying this is the policy proposal that we absolutely need to adopt. But what we need to be doing is thinking much more broadly about what dairy policy can look like, what dairy parity can look like in a way that benefits all communities and the environment and consumers. Um, and there are some particular principles that underlie any of any policy that, that would fulfill those goals. So I'll leave it there um, and uh, look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Sienna. It appears that there are three people who know about dairy policy. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is Jose Oliva. Jose is from Shilahu, Guatemala. He founded and directed the Chicago Interfaith Workers Council in Interfaith Workers Center in 2001 and became the coordinator of the Interfaith Worker Justice National Workers Center Network. He held several leadership positions at the Restaurant Opportunity Center United, the National Organization of Restaurant Workers. Jose was the co-founder and co-director of Food Chain Workers Alliance, a national coalition of food chain worker organizations representing over 370,000 workers. He is a recipient of the 2017 James Beard Award and the 2018 Food Heroes Award, and is currently the director of Campaigns at the Heal, Health, Environment, Agriculture, and Labor Alliance. Thanks for being here, Jose. Thank you so much, Jim, and thank you to everyone for allowing me to be part of this uh, amazing event. I, um, in some ways can't believe that I'm uh, here with uh, Dolores Huerta and the rest of the folks who are doing uh, their best to make this food system one that is good for all of us. Um, so I wanna talk to you about immigration and about labor and about race, um, all in the context of the food system, but I don't wanna talk to you about that um, I don't wanna mansplain it to you. So instead what I wanna do is I wanna tell you my story. Uh, which I think uh, embodies a lot of that. Uh, it's not a unique story. It's really the story of millions of economic or food refugees from Latin America. Uh, and I want to start with a young economist from Guatemala. He's caught up in this post-World War II idealism, and that's my grandfather. He joins students and workers and women and civil society at large uh, to establish the first democracy in Guatemala back in 1944. Uh, in 1950, he becomes the agriculture vice minister. Uh, then, after 10 short years of democracy in 1954, a coup sponsored by the CIA overthrows uh, this fledgling republic. Um, the coup happened at the bequest of the United Fruit Company, which today we know as Chiquita, <laughs> uh, because a new agrarian program led by my grandfather was giving land to landless peasants. Um, now here's the connection. John Foster Dulles was the CEO of the United Fruit Company uh, and they owned approximately one third of all of the arable land in Guatemala. Uh, the land reform program uh, sought to buy that land from the United Fruit Company and redistribute it to landless peasants. 
uh, and the United Fruit Company didn't like it. Uh, so uh, he called his brother, John, <laughs> called his brother, Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA. <laughs> and together with the Guatemalan military, they engineered a coup and deposed the elected president, Jacobo Arbenz Guzman, and established a military dictatorship. Now, my grandfather, disillusioned and angry, moves his family to Shela, which is where uh, both my mother and I were born. Uh, she's taught, my mother is taught about the aborted agrarian form uh, and this sort of frustrated dream uh, of democracy really early on. Uh, but the coup also triggers a long and bloody civil war. Uh, and in the context of the Cold War, anyone who opposes the regime is branded a communist. Uh, over 200,000 people are murdered, over a million people are displaced as refugees, um, my family amongst them. Uh, we came to the US after my mother, who was a school teacher, attempted to organize the parents from the school uh, to demand running water and electricity in the schoolhouse. Uh, however, coming to the US wasn't easy. There was no official refugee status uh, for anyone fleeing the conflict or the consequences. So we were undocumented for almost 20 years. Um, and after being a teacher back in Guatemala her entire life, uh, my mother ended up like many immigrants working in the restaurant industry, in the food system. Um, there she worked hard for measly wages and was constantly sexually harassed. Uh, then when I graduated high school and wanted to go to college, uh, I realized that I was undocumented and I couldn't access any scholarships or grants. Um, so I started working in the restaurant industry and paid for my credit hours in college as I went along. Um, this gave me a worm's eye view of both the food system and the immigration system, and especially how we treat workers, uh, especially immigrants, women, and people of color. Um, after graduating college, I started to volunteer at a local community group here in Chicago called Casa Guatemala. One day a woman came in crying, saying her husband had been kidnapped. Um, and at first I thought, well, that must've happened in Guatemala. That happened a lot uh, in the 80s and 90s. Um, but when we investigated her claim, we realized that the whole thing happened here in uh, this informal economy. Um, that is a day labor economy. So that, along with my own experience in the restaurant industry, led me to, along with several of my coworkers, to create a worker center, um, the Chicago Interfaith Worker Center, where we helped organize restaurant workers and other informal uh, workers, which I call the original gig economy. Um, some workers uh, called us to complain about a horrible treatment um, at a fine dining restaurant. Um, and remembering my own experience in the industry, we sprang to action. We brought local pastors, media, community members to this impromptu march on the boss. Um, and when he first saw us, he immediately kicked us out. Um, so we started to march out in front telling customers um, what was happening. And as they entered and entered the restaurant, we gave them these flyers that we made that had the story of one of the workers on one side. And then the other side just said really big, do not patronize this business. Uh, so within minutes, the manager was outside trying to get us inside <laughs> so he could talk and negotiate. Um, and we negotiated, a, you know, this agreement with him that the workers liked um, and when we left there, I thought that we had invented a whole new model of organizing workers. Um, <laughs> that is until I met uh, the good folks at Rock. Uh, and they explained to me that Rock had been winning agreements like the one that we got uh, with restaurants for years. Uh, so instead of reinventing the wheel, I decided to join Rock and help them form the national network that is now Rock United. Um, and at Rock, we realized uh, that there was this sort of new breed of food consumer out there. Um, our members consistently reported that customers would ask about the food in ways they'd never seen before. So it was like, where was this chicken raised? Or is this produce organic or so forth? Um, and this trend did not slow down in subsequent years. Uh, as a matter of fact, it kind of picked up steam. Um, we started to hear from other worker organizations like Tata, which represents farm workers, 
uh, brand workers, which represents processing workers, and they were all telling us the same thing. Um, so finally, in 2008, we decided together with Kata brand workers and the other food worker organizations uh, to launch an alliance of food workers with this sort of dual purpose of inserting workers into the ongoing discourse around food and to explore what a multi-sector campaign to improve the food system overall would look like. And that's how we formed the Food Chain Workers Alliance. Um, however, even with our newfound unified voice, we realized pretty quickly actually that food workers alone would not be able to transform our food system. Uh, the cards were just stacked against us. So we sought to convene organizations that focused on food from other perspectives, the perspective of health or what food does to the human body, the environment, both the production and then the waste, uh, food waste, um, access to good food, agriculture, both rural and urban. Um, and in the process of doing that and convening all these organizations, uh, we realized that our idea was not novel. Uh, there were other people out there convening food system-wide multi-sector alliances. Um, I like to think that I know I'm on the right path when I invent something that someone else has already invented. Um, and that's what happened. It happened once with Rock, and then it happened again with Heal. Um, Navina, Kana, Neem Steele, uh, Ricardo Salvador, others had been uh, convening the same groups um, and had moved further down the road than, than we were. Uh, so again, we didn't compete, we complemented. Uh, and together at Heal, we've worked to move major food service corporations like Aramark, Sodexo, Compass Group, uh, through the Real Meals campaign. Um, we launched the School of Political Leadership for food system leaders seeking to create a food system we need to thrive. Um, together with Food Chain Workers Alliance, uh, we launched the translocal uh, campaign to ensure our public institutions are purchasing the food that is fair, sustainable, equitable, humane. Um, we've also been at the forefront of challenging and channeling uh, philanthropic notions of who is to lead the change we need in our food system. Um, because as the old African proverb says, nothing about us without us is for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. A very compelling story. Our final speaker is Ken Meter. Ken is the president of Crossroads Resource Center in Minneapolis. He learned about parity and farm credit while covering the 1980s farm credit crisis as a journalist. Today he serves as one of the most experienced food system analysts in the U.S., partnering with community food initiatives in 144 regions, 41 states, two provinces, and four native tribes. His recent book, Building Community Food Webs, documents how the U.S. food systems extracts wealth from rural communities and profiles eight of the most innovative food systems effort that he has been work, working on within the U.S. And I'd like to just add that Ken is one of those very few ag economists who's really willing to tell things like it is. So thank you very much, Ken. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much for that warm introduction and for Jose for your testimony and for all the other speakers, uh, Santa and Patty, for uh, really great information. I'm, I'm really happy to be in this call uh, in large part because uh, so many people I have really not talked to for decades are on it. And I, I, um, I noticed right away that uh, Carolyn Mugar is on the call. She actually um, was kind enough to review some early drafts of this work back in 1986. And I think her, her best question was um, to ask me why I was writing about this. And uh, now, all these decades later, I have a, a, a lot to share, I think. Um, I'm going to really just, um, I, I didn't have an advantage, to, I didn't have the opportunity to talk with uh, the, the speakers before this presentation. So I hope that what I say will be um, compatible and complementary to what's already been heard. I don't, I, I won't really know until we get there. But I would like to share a few slides about my work. And um, um, I should also mention, as I'm setting this up too, that I'm, I'm living on land that is the homelands of the Lakota and Anishinaabe uh, peoples who have been very, um, you know, harshly displaced here as well. Um, can you everybody see the slides now? 
Yes. I think we can. Okay, good. So I, I want to start the start the picture with uh, Kurt and, and Karina Bench from uh, Elmore, Ohio. Who Kurt had used to have a job with Archer Daniels Midland, working at a grain trading company, and he quit that job um, uh, a few years ago so he could run a CSA farm full time in in the Toledo area. He wanted to raise his grandfather's sweet corn, which was the best sweet corn in the market. And he spent about six years working for ADM full-time so he could hire 21 people part-time to manage his farm. And finally was able to get his business set up to where he could do um, the farming full-time. This map will show you the places that I've been lucky enough to work in the last few uh, decades. And uh, this, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, I guess I can't go back. Um, let's see if I can. Um, the brown, state, brown areas are studies I've done that are statewide and the green areas are small regions. It's actually a little bit out of date, but um, worked for four tribes on food sovereignty plans on two Canadian provinces, as well as in 41 states. Um, as Jim mentioned, I've had a book come out in April and I'm gonna base a lot of my comments based on that. I think I'm one of the few people in the universe who's tried to really document the extraction, extractive nature of the US farm economy. Um, a lot of people understood that viscerally back in the farm credit crisis of the 80s, but uh, and now everybody kind of takes it for granted, but I've also tried to put some numbers to that analysis. This is the last 100 or, 100 or so years of farm income in the United States from 1910 to 2018. And the orange line shows how much farmers have earned selling their products through the years, and the maroon line shows how much they've uh, they've spent on production expenses over that time. Um, very strong growth in both sales, but unfortunately also in production expenses. So if you look at the red line, which subtracts the expenses from the income, you find out that um, net, net cash income for farmers has stayed pretty steady, even as the growth, the tremendous growth in um, uh, um, sales took place. And I would also add that since 1948, about this point in the chart, just about the point where they diverge, farmers have doubled productivity, but the return has not been there for those farmers. Also, the same data now adjusted for inflation actually tells a very different story. So this is the chart going back to 1910 again, the same lines, cash receipts are orange, production expenses are brown, and the net cash income is red. And I think this actually shows very different patterns. Instead of really a pattern of steady, strong growth, like a lot of us believe, it's really been a lot of ups and downs. And in many ways, um, conditions are worse now than they were before. You'll notice, especially on the right-hand part of the curve, the red line is down at depression area levels in 2018 before the pandemic set in. Um, I, I, I can only a book, but the four periods where farmers really made a lot of money were basically all crisis periods, um, either, well, in 1916-18, in um, because of World War I especially, and because of the demand for food for soldiers, and also um, um, prices being pretty high. Um, in, 19, in, in the post-war era, during the period area, era um, in part because we loaned money to Europe to buy grain and other commodities from U.S. farmers, in 1973, because the farm credit crisis uh, during the farm uh, far, during the farm crisis during the energy crisis, farmers were as as Jim as uh, Betty mentioned in fact in uh, asked to plant fence row to fence row, and for about two years made a lot of money, and then we had another peak in 2008 or so when um, the um, uh, the ho global housing crisis cause commodity prices to spike because investors moved from housing into commodities, causing livestock prices, uh, grain prices for livestock producers to rise and also causing um, the commodity prices to rise. Uh, the par parity era basically runs, as we heard before, from about from this era. And you can see that it was a very essential part of keeping farm income high, but also wasn't enough by itself to turn the tide. Um, so um, what this, this next chart really compares the, um, the government payments to farmers compared with interest payments farmers have paid back to the lenders in this country. And this is a really pr pretty profound chart. You see from 1910 to 1933 that there was um, a, a steady decline because there was no government payments whatsoever. From 1933 to 1973, during the plant fence or defense row days, 
there was a fairly strong set of balance, sense of balance where the, it, the government payments gave, given to farmers actually directly compensated farmers for the interest payments they made to a, a, a lending sector that was increasingly becoming not so commodity oriented, not, not, not localized, but more of a kind of commodity of its own and also more of a global commodity market. And then 1973, as you say, really led to an incredible uh, extractive push for the farm, US farm economy. Um, I track $800 billion lost in those in that chart, but then there's also been chemical and fertilizer purchases, fuel purchases, pesticide purchases. And I don't have really good data about other very major purchases like farm machinery, technical advice, seeds and livestock, but I can track about $3.2 trillion of cumulative losses through what farmers have purchased that in the old days, farmers could actually produce their own fertility and often run their, uh, run their own horses and run their own um, machinery in that sense. So that it's been a tremendous loss from the farm sector. I'm tracking a total of $4 trillion leaving the US farm sector in the last hundred years. And that's an inflation adjusted dollars. You can compare that with the total farm assets today of only $3 trillion. So it's not necessarily a large amount of money, amount of money in the national scheme of things, but it's certainly a, um, a large amount when you look at the farm sector, especially all the farms that have been gone have gone out of business and are not measured here because they're no longer holding assets. Um, I think I, I, that causes me to ask what what conditions would actually make parity work in this country. Uh, the the one thing I think is really important to note is that the prior conditions no longer apply. U.S. could get parity in the old in the in the forties because we were one of the largest producers globally and we could dominate world trade and pretty much be price setters. That's no longer true. Um, farm income among farmers was also more, more equal too. So you could, set a, a, you could set a pricing policy that affected people more or less equally. Um, there's also been difficulties with national pr pricing formulas that are imprecise given farm and regional variability. When you have a starting out as a farm, you need a higher price than if you're an experienced farmer who, who stresses a commodity system, but not a food system. More and more farmers are, are really people who raise raw materials for industrial processing. And that commodity system really dictates the terms in which we get food. Uh, and increasingly, we don't get food from American farms. We get it from abroad. Uh, and as I'm sure other people are in this call very clearly understand, parity mostly helped white farm owners because they were the ones who helped write the farm policy in the first place. I think some of the minimal conditions would be to protect um, food systems in the US from global markets. I think there's a conversation with the WTO, WTO about putting some protection around internal food trade and keeping that separate from global commodity trade. Um, also though, uh, to politically, to last politically, it has to involve buy buyers as well as policies, including both wholesale buyers and consumers, because without that, you don't have political support to keep it going. Uh, pricing formulas have to probably be localized and also adapt to climate change and other changes that are occurring on a daily basis. And then obviously we have to address equity in a better way than we did in the farm credit in the farm days, farm policy days of the 30s. I, I guess my, my, my quick take home would just be that there's no answer to agriculture without constructing equitable food systems. I hope my book um, not only documents the extraction of wealth, but also offers some really inspiring stories of eight places in places as diverse as Hawaii, Tucson, Colorado, um, Indiana, Ohio, uh, Minnesota, um, Montana, where people have really taken uh, these issues and made some very powerful stuff happening by building collaborations that are based on regional food systems and not strictly on commodity policy. I also just want to make a quick comment. I think we're in a very dangerous area in this regard right now because a lot of investors who are naive are getting involved and they want to make something happen really quickly about issues they've ignored for decades. And they're investing in ways I think are quite naive and quite uh, questionable. So we have to really understand very clearly what we're working for and what we don't want to have happen. That's a slide showing my contact information. And this will, of course, be available to everybody else, too. But I think that's all I need to say right now. Thanks very much, Ken. Um, so that's, that's it for our panelists. And now it's uh, my real pleasure to uh, 
introduced Dolores Huerta. Uh, you know, we, we all talk about the fact that we're standing on the shoulder of giants, and I certainly think Dolores is one. Um, founder and president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation, civil rights activist and community organizer. She's worked for labor rights, social justice for over 50 years. In 1962, she and Cesar Chavez founded the United Farm Workers Union. She served as vice president and played a critical role in many of the union's accomplishments for four decades. In 2002, she received the Puffin Nation $100,000 prize for creative citizenship, which she used to establish the Dolores Huerta Foundation. This foundation is connecting groundbreaking community-based organizing to state and national movements to register and educate voters, advocate for education reform, bring about infrastructure improvements in low-income communities, advocate for greater equality for the LGBT community, and create strong leadership development. She has received numerous awards. Among them is the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2012, the highest civilian honor in the United States. So again, Dolores, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll, we're all hanging on your every word to hear how you would wrap this up. Well, I have been hanging on every word that has been spoken. There is so much incredible information. And, uh, you know, many, many years ago, I remember saying to people that we really have to uh, concern ourselves about what's happening with our food, uh, because uh, we know that there were just a few conglomerates that control uh, the energy supply, the oil supply of our country. And we could see that that trend was going also towards agriculture. And that of course is a very, very scary notion that you would have a few big processors that would control uh, the food supply uh, of the United States of America. And then also we have to say, also we have to add the world. I know that uh, Daljeet uh, Sony is on our uh, panel here today. She's in, in our conference today. And we have seen what is happening to uh, the farmers in India, where they are trying to replicate the same, same type of an agricultural system in India that we have in the United States of America, where you have a few huge uh, agribusiness of farmers that start controlling not only the food supply, but the price of the food supply. And we know that food is uh, something that is uh, so necessary and inherent uh, to the to the to humans and we can't live of course without food I mean, we can't live without water and so th this is something that uh, people really have to pay attention to and we uh, because we are such a rich uh, country and we have such a, such great agricultural resources uh, people kind of take food for granted they don't think about how it's grown or how it's processed, how it's distributed. And again, uh, how, how people are, are paid uh, for growing the food in our country. And it is something that we do have to, uh, to care about. I know that right now there's a movement uh, that is going on uh, nationally that is starting many of the younger people and not, are starting to pay attention uh, to agricultural systems and they wanna get into growing food uh, we see that there, are, uh, we have urban, urban gardens. People are starting to grow their own food in their own gardens. So we do see that they're like everything else that is happening in our country not right now. That we have a, a reawakening that that is going on, and people, especially young people, are asking questions, and they are want they also want answers and are, are trying to uh, starting to create a, a a justice food justice movement in the United States of America. And so many of the issues that were addressed here today, and I want to thank Mr. Oliva for talking about what happened in Guatemala. And when we think of all of the refugees that are coming to our border from Guatemala, and yes, the United States, we have uh, we have uh, to do some uh, penance and also uh, pay Guatemala back for all of the harm that we did to that country, uh, the many hundreds of thousands of people that were killed, and it was all we know promoted by the United States of America. And even today, uh, and when we talk about the food supply, we do have to start thinking, I think, globally, uh, because it is uh, now uh, also a global issue. Uh, you know, when we think about the, the many of the of the of the of the people from Mexico that came here, the Mexican farmers uh, who were affected by our, our food policies, because uh, even though the corn, the maize comes from Mexico, uh, uh, Mexico now imports more corn from the United States than what they grow in Mexico. And this of course uh, really caused, uh, when we had the previous NAFTA uh, policies in the United States, that created this movement of so many of the people that migrated to the United States because these small 
family Mexican farmer could not compete with the agribusiness uh, from the United States of America. So Mexico imports more corn from the United States than what they grow in Mexico, although this is where the corn came from. It came from Mexico. And speaking of Guatemala, you know, I often say when, in my speeches, when we think of the refugees that are coming, uh, I use the word bananas. You know, how many bananas uh, do we eat in the United States of America every single day? But the money that we pay for the bananas, it does not go uh, to uh, the people in Guatemala uh, on whose land the bananas are produced or who also produce the fruit. No, it goes again to the United Fruit Company, the company that was responsible uh, for a lot of the damage that was done to that country in the first place. So we have a lot of work to do and, and trying to create a, a fair and a just food supply, not only for the United States, but also for the world. And again, if we can think globally, we think of all of the food that we throw away in the United States of America that farmers, again, are often limited in what, what they can produce again uh, because of the prices. And, and, and again, uh, you know, we have to think of the farm workers and making sure that they are also taken care of. When we think of, the, of the, these systems that we have now, the agribusiness systems, even during the pandemic that we have just suffered through, so many of the farm workers were not <clears throat> given the protective equipment that they needed <clears throat> because their bosses, they're not out there in the farm with them. They're in San Francisco or they're uh, in, in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, they're not out there on the farms with the workers. So yes, we have to have kind of a, a back to the line movement. Uh, we know that this is a, a farming is a very, very healthy uh, way of life uh, for people. And we know that uh, there's a lot of organic farmers when we see how much money was spent just on pesticides, which of course are harmful not only to the land, but also harmful to, to the people. We have the highest cancer rate in the United States of America than any country in the world. And that of course is caused by so many, so many of the economic poisons that are placed on our food. So we have so much work to do and I am so happy that you're having uh, this webinar. And again, let's think globally Let's see what we can do politically. I am happy to see that there are some laws now that are being passed uh, uh, to, to help the dairy farmers. And, uh, and I think with the, the, the Biden administration, we should probably take advantage of this administration to, uh, to support <clears throat> and pass how many, many policies that uh, farmer, the family farmers need in particular, and to see how we can somehow make sure that they get a fair return for the work that they do, and at the same time, create a just food supply for everyone. We can make it happen through organizing. So I wanna thank all of the brilliant people that, uh, that were on our webinar today. Uh, thank you for all of the information that you shared with us. And yes, we have to keep on learning. Uh, we have to, of course, uh, you know, think about all of the great information that we have here today and, uh, and learn. Learn some more and act some more and do the work that we need to do. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me a part of the webinar. Si se puede, we can make it happen. Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. Um, perfectly stated. Um, you've been at this for a while and thank you for all you've done. Thank you so much. Well. Thank you so much, Dolores, amazing comments. Um, so many questions, so many chats in the chat box um, and in the Q&A. Um, so please feel free to dive in and read. Patty and Sienna have been answering a few. There's a lot of information. Also, we'll be sending out an email to all of the registrants with a copy of the questions, preliminary answers, and then we're gonna be fleshing out the answers with other links. Um, one question was about the relationship between immigration and parity. That needs to be many books and oral histories with Jose's family, lots of you know, extraordinary specific information about Mexico and NAFTA and dumping, and then farmers as farm workers as just farmers without land. So um, a wonderful kind of inquiry um, that we'll be developing further. Um, there's also some great questions and comments about um, the net cash income and how it relates to, so closely to the rise and fall of the parity farm programs. And much of this information is on the website very specifically about how the 1940s had parity level price floors that then were reduced in the 1950s. And then by the 1996 farm bill completely erased. Um, but maybe I'll pass the mic to um, some of our panelists to respond to some of the great questions in the chat box and Q&A. 
I can take a crack at the question around the connection between immigration and parity. Um, now, I, I do want to say that I'm not an expert on parity. That is, that is not something that I've worked on and, and not something that HEAL is, is uh, steeped in. Um, but I can tell you that um, everything from uh, feed to the labor costs are directly related to uh, policies, both internal domestic policies uh, and international policies that the US government has, right? And so um, uh, Gary just hinted at one big one, which is NAFTA and how that created a huge wave of immigration to the United States. And it, it had a direct impact on parity, um, both because of what it did to corn and what it did to some of the other commodities. Um, and it also had a real uh, impact in the lives of the people in, in Mexico. Um, and so that, that created one wave of migration. My story is meant to illustrate uh, a previous wave of migration, although that, that wave is ongoing um, and, and almost uh, being revisited right now with folks coming to the border. Um, and that is, you know, US, uh, direct US imperialism in parts of the hemisphere that caused immigration to, to this country. Um, so th that's, uh, I think if you dig even just a little deeper into that, you'll see that there's layers of how that impacts um, pricing and uh, all of the issues that have to do with parity. You're muted, Ken. Um, I really like what Jose's, the, the story Jose has been telling all day today, but um, I wanted to uh, also chime in. My own family's immigrant experience would be that uh, my great grandfather came in 1851 and um, the rest of my family came in the 1880s and they all came looking for land in a, in a time when farming was terrible and the economics of farming were dismal. And that's really what got me to start on this work, work in the first place. But without any parity or any kind of public policy um, supporting them. My, great, my grandfather, uh, Joseph, uh, was farming in Nebraska uh, at the time, and he became by reputation one of the best farmers in his county, but he never was able to own land because the economics of farming were so terrible. Um, and um, I think the, uh, oh, I, um, it's basically that you know a lot of the, a lot of the settlers in the Midwest came out, and they all their neighbors were growing food, and they came out in debt because they were trying to buy land, and so the only real course they had was to export commodities to a distant market. And if the United States had, uh, after kicking tribes off the land, had at least set policy to make communities strong, we would have a, had a very different trajectory of development in this country. I can just add a little bit. I, I, I think both those answers are really helpful. I'll just add a little bit, which maybe ties into another question that got asked earlier. Um, is like, if we are taking the radical step and it would, this is yet another question in the chat, right? This would be radical to have policy that says, you know, we need to think about that, that there's a role for the government to intervene in the cycle of just kind of constant overproduction and downward pressure on price. So that's step number one, that is the political hill we will climb because we need to. Number two is if you get to the point of saying there is a role for the government to intervene in these markets, which I think all of our speakers say that there is, you know, it's not good enough just to say the government will guarantee a price. We have to have a mechanism that sets the right price and includes all of these costs. So somebody asked a question about, you know, externalities and how do you capture them all? You know, historically, I think at least where I came up and this shows my path, right? We think about externalities on the environment, but we are treating unfair, you know, we're, we're kind of putting unfair treatment of people in that system in that column too, that it's not something that has to be reflected in the cost of doing business. So if we are setting policy that says, you know, there is a floor below which a price cannot fall. We need to do a good job of calculating that number. And it includes high practices because there are regulations we enforce about how you treat the environment, how you treat people, what you pay them. So whether it's 
you know, heat standards in the fields or line speeds in a meat plant or, you know, what water discharge you can have from an operation. If we have good standards, we enforce them. Everyone's following them. And then we calculate the price based on doing it that right way. That's the policy we have to get to, to say that is a price that would be equitable across all of those factors, right? And so that has to be written well. That's what we have to do when we design these policies is not forget any of those parts uh, so that that's suddenly an extra cost, right? Like we need to calculate the cost properly and then say that's what the policy is going to provide. And I'll just chime in on that too. Thank you, Patty. Um, yes, I completely agree with all of that. Um, and I've, my brain is going in a couple of different directions, but um, the, right, what, so that one, one critique that gets made about um, historical parity programs is that they were discriminatory, um, they favored large farmers. Those things are true. What this project is working on, the disparity to parity project and all of our, these partners are working on is what does it look like to, to design that a similar kind of program in a different way that, as Patty says, does actually account for all of those externalities. Um, and there's partly a, a narrative shift here too, um, where a lot of people now will say, oh, but you know, large, bigger is better, bigger is more efficient in agriculture. Like, how do you define efficient? I don't see today's agriculture as being terribly efficient because there are all of these costs that are being paid by other entities that are not the, the mostly corporate corporate entities who are profiting. Um, you know, they're not the ones who are paying for undrinkable water or public health concerns, all of those things. So there's a piece here that's about um, redefining what efficient looks like, um, you know, it, societally, I think, and culturally. Um, and, and then I think, you know, it's, it's, it is really important to acknowledge um, and this is what I said in the, the chat, the Q&A answer. Um, this is a place, um, parity has, and, and US farming, farm policy has never addressed labor well at all. It is US farm policy is based on below cost labor, labor whether that is enslaved labor um, or immigrant labor that usually is, um, is exploiting folks, um, as well as right everything else that um, that the other speakers have said. Um, so you know, it's this is a it's a big question. Um, we don't have anything to look back to, um, and just to like be really clear, like this that's not what this project is doing. We are not looking back to some you know romanticized day when um, in the past that that parity programs were perfect. Um, we're looking at what they're at, at what worked. And then what else needs to work and how they need to be designed um, in a way that does work for everyone. There was another, it was a great point, Sienna. I'm so glad this is being recorded. There was another key question about um, black farming cooperatives, um, specifically the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and their history with parity. Um, one of the main goals of this project, Disparity to Parity, is to recover the extraordinary leadership of the Federation in the farm justice movement, which has largely been erased. It's not really on the internet. So even excavating some of these incredible archives of leadership by Ralph Page and Jerry Pennick and others and Ben Burkett and his essay is on the Disparity to Parity website. I've dropped that link. So there's a very important set of histories about um, about how the black farming cooperatives in the Deep South were able to make use of the cotton program to stave off racism, but also the implementation of it was still racist. So the memory of thinking through what could be updated to, um, in, to encourage a whole new generation of BIPOC led young growers to make a living in farming um, through an updated parity system. That, that is a great point. And, and I think um, the other part of that history, even predating the Federation would be some of the black co-ops who formed after reconstruction and also in the 1920s when they could form co-ops, they could um, very easily produce um, crops, very easily produce processed foods, but no one would buy because they were not supporting black farmers. And that's why this whole effort to bring voters and consumers and buyers into the equation is really critical.
there's some other great questions um, about, um, there's a misconception that rising costs or raising um, co farm gate prices will be carried over directly to the consumer. Um, and so there's been a lot of research on chronicling how actually that's not the case um, with the vast majority of crops and the vast majority of foods. Um, it's the corporate buyers that capture the profit. And so with more direct um, supply chains, with antitrust, as well as with updated parity policies, there, there will be economic structures wherein there's um, a balance of supply and, and, and supply is coordinated such that the price that a farm farmer, diverse farmers receive isn't carried over into consumers. But I don't know if anyone else on the panel wants to dive into that question. Well, I, I guess I just comment that uh, going back to that Jesse Jackson statement that good, good uh, urban policy starts with good farm policy. And I, I don't, I've never thought that we should uh, be supportive of a cheap food policy just because we have poor people. And I think in the last month, which has been referred to as striketober, uh, people are saying we're not going to work for those jobs that don't pay us enough to make a living anymore. So I think that has to be part of this whole equation that everybody has to make a decent living so they can afford to support farmers with fair prices or teachers with fair wages or whatever your job is. And, and I, I think that's something we have to remember that if we're going to change, we can't just change part of society. I think we're, we have to look at the big picture and try and change it all so everyone has a fair shot. Yeah, that makes sense to me. We've gotten, I mean, we've, this is a perennial question. It's going to be a question right now because there's front page news today about what is your Thanksgiving you know, feast going to cost you? Prices are up. We see a connection with, you know, a, increase in you know, the raw material. Most of us are buying very processed foods, right? We're not buying a bushel of wheat or a live chicken, right? So when the raw material, that live chicken or that bushel of wheat, when those costs go up, of course, consumer prices go up, right? But when those prices crash, which does happen sometimes, the consumer prices don't come down. Like we have a one-way direction when we see a connection between the farm gate price and consumer prices. We're seeing this right now um, in the beef market. Um, you know, what you're paying at the store for beef is, I don't know, the chart is, you know, very, very steep increase up. And then you see what cattle producers are being paid and it's moving in the opposite direction. And that is a function of a market that isn't working well because there's not a lot of middlemen, right? We have a very tiny number of folks controlling those steps in the middle. So there's a lot of hand wringing, I feel like, when we talk about anything that might change conditions on the farm end of things, what farmers get paid, what workers get paid, how we do something. There's just lots of angst, but this will increase food prices. And we don't ever think about, well, another way to make that a more functional actual system where that feedback is happening is if we had more players in the middle. So that's where we get into all of these concepts about what is the structure of our marketplace? Who are the players? How many, how much market power do they have in that transaction? And there's policy that's given us that system too, right? And it has to be happening at the same time that we're talking about price floors and reserves and all these other things that we need to do to deal with production. We also need to deal with the structure of these markets and that's not an accident and that's not inevitable. That is the result of policy. Yes, the goal is to make farming a viable livelihood for a whole new generation of diverse growers. There was a good question about how parity policies relate to specialty crops, fruit and vegetables. Um, there are long histories of agricultural marketing boards and more complex attempts to have a quota system, cooperatives and price floors, um, slightly different than grain, slightly different than dairy, but an important history that we're trying to kind of gather in the project to think through how to update it to encourage more nourishing food production with agroecological conditions. Something I would just chime in on um, about the specialty crops, and I, I definitely don't have all the answers um, or most of the answers on this. Um, yeah, it's been enough to, to be working on dairy for all, all this time, but um, I think broadly, a really important point to note is the consolidation, not only of, um, of farming um, and actual farms, but the processing infrastructure. Um, and that was something that really changed um, in the 80s, um, where there used to be around the country many more um, small scale 
uh, milk bottlers, dairy plants, uh, slaughterhouses, canneries, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, those are definitely not like always good jobs, um, but they can be. Um, and they can, as, as Ken talks about, that really can be some some very important um, economic development and a way for um, for money to be kept in the um, in a local community. So without all of those, without that infrastructure, processing infrastructure, um, that's thinking about specialty crops, fruits and vegetables is really hard and complicated um, because there's just no place nearby. Uh, there's no buyers nearby um, who can who can process any of it. So I think that's, um, you know, that's, that's not an answer about parity, but that is a really important piece is how can we invest in um, regionalized and localized um, and locally owned, especially um, processing infrastructure, particularly that, um, that provides good jobs. And also then like, where are we training people um, to, to be able to work in those places? What are the job training programs um, for, for workers um, so that they really are like good skilled jobs? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I, I of course packed too much in and ran out of time. And I had one last slide just showing kind of the amount of money we spent in under the heading of farm, farm payments, farm policy. We could invest in a whole lot of things if we weren't, uh, such as, you know, regional processing infrastructure for regional food systems, like we could, we could help people shift to more diversified things. We could do a lot of stuff if we weren't constantly every couple of years inventing a new way to write checks to make up for the fact that folks can't get paid what they need in, in markets that are dominated by this overproduction, right? So, you know, sometimes some farm bill cycles, we call it direct payments. We subsidize crop insurance. We just make payments when we lose an export market like China because we're so dependent on the export market because we overproduce and then suddenly we have to write checks because they close that market. We spend a lot of money and we could redirect that money and invest in all of the things we're talking about that build a, a different system. And again, that's a choice. Um, and so I think that's an interesting thing. You know, we need to have the right farm policy for these core commodity crops for dairy. Maybe you need to set up um, you know, a support system or a price floor system for specialty crops. Maybe you don't, I'm not an expert in that, but we could absolutely invest in a system that gives farmers more options to find a market that works better to pay them what they need and then do a good job on all the other things that they need to do um, in terms of you know, the environment and people and animals and all that other stuff. There, there was a question in the chat about uh, just if farmers do get fair prices, they won't necessarily pay their workers more. And the, he's wondering if there's a movement to make farm workers covered under general employment law and minimum wage. Uh, I'm not sure if any of the panelists could address that. Jose, maybe you have some experience in this with food chain workers. Uh, I gotta say the real expert is Dolores Huerta, uh, but I'll tell you what I know, uh, which is, yeah, there's a, there's a few um, pieces of legislation out there that are intending, there's, there's certainly state-based um, legislation in California and Florida and some of the other big farming states that would do that. Um, obviously in California, because of the work of Dolores Huerta and, and many others, they passed the uh, California Agricultural uh, Labor Act and that obviously made a, a huge difference in uh, giving uh, ag workers the right to organize a union. Um, and they also have overtime pay and, and minimum wage pay in California as well as a result of, uh, of the work that the UFW and many others have done. Um, at the federal level, uh, giving uh, just the, the reality check of, <laughs> of where we are um, in our uh, legislative processes overall, it's very unlikely that something like that would pass. Uh, it would require an amendment of the Fair Labor Standards Act um, of 1938. And uh, if we want farm workers to have the right to organize a union without retaliation and uh, uh, overall, that would mean a revamping of the National Labor Relations Act uh, of 1935. So, you know, it, it would really be 
a huge amount of work to, to have that happen. Doesn't mean that it can't happen. And it doesn't mean that um, given where the labor market is today, that it is something that is um, <laughs> unforeseeable. Um, I think, you know, we, we've seen a lot of changes just over the course of the last couple of years um, in what people are willing to do for, um, for pay. So this is, uh, the, the labor market right now is in such a place that I think um, workers have, if, they, if we use it correctly, we have a lot of power and we could potentially move something like that. Maybe we end on that note of optimism for farm worker and farmer solidarity. Um, and Dolores Huerta, the living legend, do you, do you, any final thoughts before we close out? And as, as we wait for her, all of this is being recorded in the chat box as well. Oh, thank, thank you for that. Actually, uh, there, it, there is a way to give the farm workers uh, uh, the just wages that they need. Actually, uh, when I was negotiating contracts uh, with the growers, when we got recognition, they were able to actually give farm workers a health plan and a pension plan and other benefits just by getting rid of, rid of the labor contractors. The amount of money that they gave to the crew, the, to the labor contractors, uh, when we had direct hiring, when they hired the workers directly, uh, they were able to pay all of these other benefits without, because they didn't have to give that middleman the money. And I think the middleman is kind of a, a problem that we have in all of agriculture because they take the money that should be going to growers, uh, you know, uh, and so we can cut out the middleman like we do, <laughs> say we could do that also in, in the medical field also that the workers could have a decent living wage. And of course, now that we're gonna have universal health care, hopefully, then, and you know, at least uh, in many states now, uh, people can get a medical benefit. So then the only thing that farm workers would need is uh, retirement benefits because, uh, because the work is so physically hard that when they finish uh, working, I mean, their bodies are broken and, and they do need a pension system. And so that's the other thing that the farm workers would need. But to treat the workers decently, to give them a living wage, there's no reason why that, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't be part of the whole agricultural system. And the other thing that we have to also keep in mind, when we talk about the corporate agriculture, many, uh, many, uh, much of the food that we get, say from Mexico, for instance, is actually California growers that are growing in Mexico, okay? So, I mean, and I know we're not talking about fruits and vegetables in this particular webinar right now, but we should think of the whole agricultural system as a whole, you know, as a whole. And, uh, and I mean, really, it's not rocket science, okay? <laughs> you here on this webinar are the experts. You know how we can make this happen uh, so that we can have a, 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 a just food supply that takes care of not only the farmers. And I, I also do have to mention this, uh, Jose Oliva was talking about what happened in Guatemala, but we have to have, remember what happened in, in the United States also. Cesar Chavez's family were farmers. You know, the reason that uh, Cesar became a migrant worker is because they could not get the support that they needed during the depression because the banks would lend to white farmers, but they would never lend to the farmers of color. Cesar Chavez's family, who had actually created the irrigation system, and well, the, where the Chavez property was in Arizona, there's a, a, a big uh, profitable farm now called the Bush Church Ranch. That, that, was a, that was the property of the Chavez family. They homesteaded that property many, many years ago, but they lost it during the depression. And so there has been a lot of discrimination against the, uh, of, of people of color in terms of not only buying land, getting the resources, and, and that continues. So I know we talked about the black farmers, but please don't forget the Latino farmers also when you have these discussions. Thank you.